Hello! Welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I am Tina. Today I am reviewing The Book of Rain by Thomas Wharton. This is a literary cli-fi from 2023. It's coming out, I think, actually like tomorrow, from Penguin Random House Canada. I received this e-art from NetGalley in exchange for a fair review. Thank you, PRH Canada, for the e-book, and there are no spoilers in this review. Blending genres, timelines, and characters, The Book of Rain is an eco-fiction that shows how our connection to the nature around us is both strong and tenuous. The northern mining town of Rear Meadows is one of the three hotspots in the world producing ghost ore, a new source of energy worth 28 times its weight in gold. It's also linked with slippages of time and space that gradually render the area uninhabitable. After the town is evacuated, the whole region is cordoned off, the new no-go zone widely named the Park. Three intertwined stories flow from the disaster of Romero's. Alex Hewitt and his sister Amory were among the first to be shipped out of the contaminated town. Now an accomplished game designer, Alex has moved on, but his sister has not, making increasingly dangerous break-ins to save animals trapped in the toxic wasteland. When at last she fails to return from a trip inside the fence, Alex flies to River Meadows to search for her, enlisting her friend Michio Amano, a mathematician, who needs to transcend the known laws of physics if he and Alex are to tr succeed. Claire Foley ran away from River Meadows as a teenager and now traffics in endangered wildlife. As Alex and Michio search for Amory, Claire arrives in an island nation under threat of environmental catastrophe to retrieve her greatest prize yet, only to find herself facing a life-altering choice. And finally, in a future as distant as myth, a flock of birds sets out on a dangerous journey to prevent the extinction of their ancient enemy, humanity. The account they hand down is an epic of Gilgamesh on Norf Times, illuminating the wisdom of nature and our flawed stewardship of the planet. That was very long. <laughs> it took me until the end of the novel to realize that I had read another of Thomas Wharton's book before, and I have it here. It's called Ice Fields. I really enjoyed this one, but this book, The Book of Rain, is so different. I don't think there's any way I would have made a connection without the about the author at the end, mainly because I'm really bad with names. The literary climate fiction. It's part sci-fi, part environmentalist message, part character-driven stream of consciousness meandering. I tend to enjoy all three of these things, so I found this book entertaining, enlightening, thoughtful, and interesting, though I wouldn't go so far as to say I found it fascinating or overly emotional. While there are some minor characters who have a point of view, Michio's part was my favorite, probably because it's similar to Ice Fields and then it featured a character walking around in nature. The two main characters are Alex and Claire. Alex wasn't entirely exciting as a person. He feels like a vessel at times, perhaps because maybe he's like dead inside. <laughs> and Claire is a trickster because she starts out really interesting but grows supremely unlikable once you are involved in her story. Though I think we are meant to feel this way about her, her selfishness towards the environment, being an animal trafficker, is I think intentionally distasteful, more so because we can see the excuses she makes about these environmentally unfriendly choices reflected in the average person being lazier and caring about their carbon footprint or how wasteful they are and in the excesses at which they live without heed to the environment. So I think Claire is like a hyperbolic example of everybody not putting enough effort into thinking about how their actions are reflecting are reflected on the environment around them. Both characters have arcs about finding things they've lost, and while they are fully fleshed out characters, they aren't lovable, but such is literary fiction though. <laughs> What's riveting about the novel is the style. If you enjoy literary fiction, you know what I mean. The blending of thoughts and concepts into and around one another, the lack of exposition or even true explanation into the events or concepts, and the flowery language. As you know, if you watch my channel, I'm a pretty big advocate for environmental concerns. As such, the message behind the novel, that our fracking and destruction will not only kill the environment but lead to our own destruction, I was totally on board with. <laughs> I actually just finished listening to Regenesis, which is a fantastic nonfiction about environmental systems, farming, husbandry, and how we can reverse the damage that we have done to the environment. I totally recommend checking that out. The audiobook is absolutely fantastic. Anyway, the language in the novel is straightforward and clear, despite the stream of consciousness kind of drifting, so that I was never confused while reading. And even the metaphors and similes of the novel tie back to the environment in a way that's very clever. <laughs> The novel also exists in a sort of parallel dimension where everything is the same except Atlantis, presupposing it did exist, never sank into the sea, and there is a mysterious mineral, as it's said in a synopsis, which, when mined in abundance, creates these space-time continuum decoherence waves that warp reality for a few minutes at a time, either in slowing, showing other realities or other timelines. 
It's fascinating in that it's just an accepted part of the world. So the story, while the decoherence is important to it, isn't about like stopping it or something like that. There's a part of Alberta, as it said in the synopsis, called the reclamation area where de decoherences run wild. It has a kind of Dalgren or more aptly like annihilation feel to it at times. The sections of the novel that take place in there, while brief, were engrossing and very evocative. <laughs> the last section of the book is an epic poem that reminded me a lot of Hollow Kingdom without the comedy because it features an animal perspective. I'm not opposed to poetry in fiction, but it felt to me like it was done to save space because the whole thing was almost a story in and of itself. If you've read Seven Eves, which is similar in a way that you'll only understand if you've read both books, <laughs> I think you'll understand what I mean. <laughs> Along with finding the poem kind of like all right, I mean, to be honest, by that point, I was kind of done with the book. I also found the novel dipped into telling and not showing a lot, which was less engaging. And there are often long stretches of dialogue that could have used some action beats to break them up. I also found Claire and Alex's stories didn't really tie together. So they felt like two different books at times. And even the themes between them, while similar, they weren't strong enough to kind of link them in a way that felt resonating, I guess. Yet, overall, I really enjoyed the novel and I loved the message behind it. Another great quote from the book that pretty much sums up kind of my opinions on the matter is, when a species disappears, when an animal goes silent forever, it may not matter to us, but the truth is we have lost some part of ourselves. And that I think is kind of the overall idea of the book. And I thought that that was a very poignant and very important message. And yeah, so thank you again to the publisher for the eARC and to NetGalley for hosting it. 